Again, if we haven't met, my name is Ronaldo Pastor here, and we're going to be rolling on with our series through John, the Upper Room, uh, where we're looking at John 14 uh, to 17 over 12 weeks. And I've really been feeling an overwhelming sense of God's love for this community as we've traveled uh, as, as we've traveled together. It's been a real gift to travel with Jesus as He takes the form of a slave and washes the disciples' feet. And we learned uh, a few weeks ago, almost a month ago, that if we're ever going to receive Jesus as Lord and as Savior, we're also to receive him as servant. He, he serves us first. And out of being loved and served by the King, we go ahead and we serve and love others. And in fact, we learned that the definitive marker of the apprentice of Jesus, of the follower of Jesus, of the uh, disciple of Jesus, is that we love one another. If there's going to be one thing, one thing that defines us is love for one another. And then we learn that Jesus is the full and was the full uh, expression of the Father so that Jesus could say that if you saw me, you have seen the Father. And what we see is a God who is gentle and lowly and humble and who's never afraid of the questions and the doubts of his people. And when he sees the the troubled hearts of the disciples, he doesn't scold them in his frustration. He offers them his lasting presence, a promise of his lasting presence today. As we continue, I want to give us a fresh expression to the idea that God calls us to a life of obedience. He calls us to a life of surrender. And this is important because many of us, myself included, have been traumatized by legalism. The idea that our obedience somehow earns or keeps us in God's love. And therefore, our disobedience means uh, uh, that God no longer loves us. But Jesus tells a better story here today, a much more beautiful story, a story that doesn't coerce our obedience. And and I I don't want to just preach from my baggage, right, or from my own, just from my own history, Uh, but I feel a lot of us may be walking that road where uh, we may have been coerced into obedience in some of our church cultures. And so today I want to set us, uh, I set before us this beautiful invitation to obey. Rather than believing the lie that obedience is the condition of love, right, You get what I mean by that, that rather than believing the lie that we must first obey God for him to love us, this story tells a radically different story. In other words, we obey from the love that we've received, not for it, right? We we obey from the love. We obey out of receiving God's love rather than obeying to secure God's love. But before we jump in, Help me to pray. Father, we thank you again for your goodness to us. We thank you that, in fact, the the truest thing that we can say today, right now, is that you are good. In a world that will tell us differently, in a world that will tell us maybe that you're, you, you are absent, Lord, we, or, or, or more so that you are malevolent, we speak a different word. God, you are good. And we thank you for bringing us here today together. And we ask that you would help me to forget the things that are not going to be helpful for your people. Help me to remember the things that will be. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And the church said, and the church said, so I grew up, as you know, uh, this is a lot of, I feel like I'm running out of the social capital of saying I grew up in Brooklyn. It worked for a decade, but you know, it's, it's getting old. But as you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, small uh, Spanish-speaking Pentecostal church, and there's so much that I'm grateful for, for what I learned there. The seeds that God deposited in my life that I feel still to this day are blooming. Uh, but by and large, it wasn't what we would, what I would call a healthy church at the time. As I look back on my time there, I recognize that it taught and it lived a theology that was uh, largely born out of fear. And it, what, what it did, it looked at the world, it looked at the culture around uh, us, and it taught us to look at the culture around us, and it, it taught us to just wholesale reject everything. And what it did, it, it overreacted to everything in the world, in the culture. It, it overcorrected in the opposite direction. And what that led to was this crippling legalism, this, this stuffiness, a lack of joy, an obsession with rule keeping. 
In a word, it led to a religion of fear, of coercion, of a joyless obedience. And what it did, it overreacted to the culture. It overreacted to the world. Our problem, I think, is a different one. Our problem isn't one that we, we've, we've overcor- that we overcorrect the world. Our problem is that we dangerously come close to doing the opposite, and we begin to overreact against the stifling legalism that we may have grown up with. And so we say we don't need to follow any laws and obedience doesn't matter anymore because what we're doing is we're now overreacting to much of the overreaction that we may have grown up with, that I know I grew up with. But the same is going to be true wherever we land. However you overreact, if we operate with the frame that I grew up with, then we will become legalists because of the fear of becoming like the world. But if we operate with the opposite frame, the frame that we're more, more likely to, to, uh, to adopt today, then we will, we will become anti all discipline, anti all rules, anti all commands, and we will throw that baby out with the bathwater. And we do much of our theology and our thinking uh, in reaction to a viewpoint, in reaction to what someone else is thinking or doing. And, and what happens is we end up playing defense because we always end up overcorrecting someone else's mistake because we fear becoming that. Either way, anti-law people or legalists, we're both motivated by fear right? Fear of becoming like that. Fear of becoming like the world on one side. Fear of becoming like legalistic Pharisees on the other. It's the same fear, but it's dressed differently. One has doilies on, one wears all black. Like you you get it, right? It's the same fear dressed differently. But Jesus shows us a different way to understand and to live in relationship with with God, one that is motivated by love, not by fear. And so as we travel the text today, there are things that I'm just, I don't have time to get into because I really want to focus on this one point, that of obedience. Like what is it? And so I want to clear the weeds here and simply say this, obedience is simply to align our heart and our will to God's. Obedience is to align our heart and our will to the will of God. Scripture does not call us, and you may be surprised by this, but Scripture does not call us to a blind obedience or, simple, or simply external obedience. God doesn't just desire that we follow some rules, but he desires that we actually rule with him and that he rules through us and in, in partnership with us. And that requires humans, not robots. You, you get the difference. Obedience isn't just about what we do externally. Obedience is about bringing our our whole selves, our thinking self, our loving self, our willing self, all of who we are under the reign of Jesus. And so it involves our thinking and our willing and our loving, our affections and our behavior. But in a church culture that, and I've said this before, I've repented publicly to you before, but in a culture that says this, quote, unquote, it doesn't matter what you do. It just matters where your heart is, right? God is, is not after your, your works. He's after your heart. Whatever the hell that means, I'm not even sure anymore, but I'm telling you, I've said it before. We've all heard this, that the gospel is not about uh, uh, behavior modification. It is about heart transformation. Well, then it makes sense, right? If, if If you hear that all the time, it makes sense to see a call to obedience of a command as oppressive, as foreign, as the path to a lifeless, external, complying, boring faith. We've ripped apart what God has always kept together, and that's love and obedience. Jesus couldn't be clearer in what he is saying here today. And this is what he's saying. Now, I I want you to remember this, that love and service for Jesus and for others always must flow out of us being served by Jesus. You never serve others and you don't go out to serve Jesus on your own steam because that's the right thing to do, even though that is the right thing to do. The king comes and we serve. 
And yet he comes as a servant. And so the first thing we always must remember is that any service that we give to Jesus, any service that we give to others must first flow out of a service that we've received from Jesus. Remember what Jesus tells Peter. If you do not let me serve you, if you do not let me wash your feet, you have no part with me. And so this is what Jesus is saying, that love and obedience are two sides of the same coin, but we have made them wholly different currencies. But Jesus keeps them together. And when we understand that having faith in Christ is more than just mental assent, do you get what I, what I mean by that? That having faith in Christ is more than just in internal workings in your mind or your psyche or your heart. When we understand that it's more than that, when we understand that to have faith in Jesus is to pledge our whole life and to give our allegiance to this king, then we can begin to understand that Jesus never pulls apart love and obedience. He says this in verse 15. He says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, one of the ways that you show that is by doing what I've told you. I'm trying to get my kids to memorize. This is Bible memory verse for the Santiago home. Keeping the commandments of Jesus, we have to understand, are not ways to earn his love. They are ways of enjoying his love. They are ways of expressing his love. We show that we love Jesus when we obey him, when we do what he says. But what we realize is that we, we can't do what he says in our own power. And so Jesus makes this astonishing promise in verse 16. He says this, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of, even, listen, listen, the Holy Spirit, the, per, the third person of the Trinity is called a helper right? Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. What I'm asking you to do, Jesus says, is Uh, what I'm asking of you, I will resource you to do. I can't remember who said this. It was either Augustine in the 4th century or Luther in the 15th, but someone said this, that that, uh, uh, the gospel bids us to fly, right? The gospel tells you to fly, and I'm like, bro, I'm I'm a land creature. I don't have wings. Like, what do you, but the gospel gives you wings. It bids you to fly. It, it, It resources what it asks of you. That's the beauty and maybe for some of us, we, we don't feel like we have that resource. We don't feel like we have that help, like we have the resource to obey. And maybe for some of us here, it, it's the realization that maybe we haven't yet pledged our allegiance to Jesus. Maybe we are still just playing church or living off the steam of our parents or our friends' faith. And this isn't to scare you. This is to get you to take a good and honest look at your soul and to do what Paul says, to examine ourselves, to see if we are in the faith. Let me ask you a question, a real question. Is there a desire to obey? Even when you look at your life and you see the gaps, as I look at my own and see my own gaps, is there a desire to obey, even even if you're in a season right now where you are diving headlong into sin and disobedience, is there something in you, something in your gut, something in your soul that is crying out, I want to align my heart and my will to God's? And I, I want to offer this to you as a pastor, someone who deeply loves you, that if that is not there, if we're just cool with whatever, if you have no desire at all for wholeness or holiness, if you care not an iota about obeying your Lord, then let me put it to you that you may not be a Christian here today. I didn't want to come and like, it's a nice day. I don't want to come to ruin your day. But let me tell you, it is much better to realize today than the day when we come and we face Jesus and we say, Lord, Lord, and he says, what? I never knew you. 
Do you have a desire to surrender? And if you do, then I, I would invite you to repent of your good works. Repent of the times that you tried to keep it all together. Repent of your religiosity. Repent of the ways that you have placed your trust and your allegiance maybe in your own work and not Christ's. But Jesus continues here in verse 21. He says this, whoever, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Jesus simply is doing this. He's reiterating what he is saying and he's extending the thought. And he's saying that, that when those who obey, he will manifest himself. He will show himself to the ones who keep his commands. Now, this is not a prize. We need to understand. This isn't some uh, late night infomercial saying for the first 500 callers, you get some, some extra, right? If you obey, you, you get a bit of extra Jesus, that's not what he's saying. It's actually pretty simple to understand. He's saying, if out of the love, out of the love that we've received from Jesus, we love him in response, we are aligning our hearts and our minds and our whole selves to his heart and his mind and, and his self, it makes perfectly good sense that in, in that interaction, he manifests himself. Because we are beginning more and more to what? To look like him, to feel like him, to think like him, to act like him. We don't earn this. We don't earn his presence, but by our alignment with it, we actually get to enjoy it more fully. Jesus says so again in verse 23 when he says, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. And there's this beautiful relationship that exists, this mysterious relationship that when we receive the love of God, it, it actually enables us to give it back. And the way that we show love of God is by our obedience. God does not need our good works, but your neighbor does, right? God needs nothing from us. He, he needs absolutely nothing, and yet our neighbor needs our good works. As Matthew 25 teaches us so clearly, something that we've gone over and over and over again here in just two years, we've, we've looked at it so many times. I want you to remember this, that as we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ is how we treat Christ. It, it boggles my mind that Paul was on the road to Damascus after uh, uh, the stoning of Stephen. He was the coat check guy, right? He's like, I'll, I'll watch your coats. You go kill this guy. I'm on my way to kill some more Christians. And on the road to Damascus, Jesus blinds him, knocks him on his backside. And what does Jesus say? Jesus doesn't say, why are you persecuting my church? Why are you persecuting my people? He doesn't say that. He says, Paul, Saul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Matthew 25, when we, when we meet Jesus in, on his glorious throne, he says to these folks, he says, those who you visited and who you ministered to and who you clothed and who you gave water to, you did that to me. And those who you didn't do that to, you didn't do it to me. And there's this mysterious kind of experience extension of the incarnation that the people of God, as we treat the people of God, is how we treat Jesus. And so I want to help us reimagine what it looks like to keep love and obedience together. So I just want to give you three things as I close. And what I mean by that is we're still here for a little while. But the first thing is this. First, we need to view the command of Jesus as invitations. We need to learn how to, we need to redraw this map in our minds and in our hearts that we need to see and view the commands of Jesus as invitations. We don't like commands, do we? I don't, anyway. I'm not, I'm not sure how, how you roll, but we would much rather suggestions. We don't mind suggestions depending on who they're coming from and what tone they're delivered in. We don't mind suggestions, but commands we don't do too well with. And I understand that may maybe some of you do. It differs on our personality or the kind of particular traumas that we may be carrying in our bodies. Uh, we're all different. And so we, we, we may be okay with commands, but generally speaking, we're not a generation or a culture that's too in love with commands. And I think of commands, I think of despotic leaders or some of my own previous managers or bosses. But what if, what if these commands were coming from the humble, gentle, 
loving Father who's expressed in Jesus. The, the one who comes and has all the right to tell us, you wash my feet. You wash my dirty feet. I, I am Lord. I, I, I am King. I'm, I'm the rabbi here. You wash my feet. What, what kind of commands are going to come from the person that Jesus expresses? How would those commands be expressed when they're coming from the heart of one who loves and who is love? They come as invitations. They come as invitations to life. They come as an invitation to love. They come as an invitation to get over yourself. They come as an invitation to serve others, to feed the hungry, to care for those who are on the margins, to speak truth to power and to preach the gospel. They come as invitations to kill sin, to turn away from falsehood and to pursue justice. These things are not oppressive. They are expressions of our freedom in this broken world. And so when we read a command of Jesus, we read it as an invitation to enter into life. We don't treat Siri this way when she's telling us how to go, how to get from A to B. It's like we put in the destination, she tells us what to do, and we do it. Even sometimes when it's illegal, like what I did, I went through a bus depot the wrong way because I'm just so like I have to obey this voice. They're invitations. They are ways through which we get to enjoy and express God's Love And so if we're going to redraw this map in our minds today, we are going to begin to understand the commands of Jesus as invitations into life. Listen, you are not forced to follow Jesus. You're not forced to be here. You're not forced to be a member of a local community of God's people. You get no brownie points. Maybe you won't show up next week. But you get no brownie points in heaven. Like, you get that. It is all by invitation. One of my favorite stories in the Gospels is when Jesus goes to this rich young ruler. And, well, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, you sell all of your possessions, you give it to the poor, and you come and follow me. And the rich young ruler just walks away, sad. And Jesus is like, if I was Jesus... Man, I'd use magic, right? Or like change his heart. Like, like I, I chase after him and try to convince him, bring out my PowerPoint, get my clicker. Let me show you what you're missing out by not following me. And Jesus lets him go. Why? Because Jesus will refuse to coerce faith. Jesus will refuse to coerce or guilt people into following him. We are free to be here or not. And when we begin to view God's commands as invitations rather than oppressive rules to check off, we will begin to think about repentance as a sweet experience. Right? Repentance, what an ugly word in our culture, in, in our church cultures. When was the last time we, we talked about repentance? Why? It's because we're thinking of Westboro Baptist Church in the South with like repent or die or go to hell. That's when we, th- we think that's what we think about repentance. But repentance is a sweet invitation to say turn and, and enter into life. So the first thing that we need to remember that we need to sort of redraw is that the commands of Jesus are invitations. The second thing is that the commands of Jesus are beautiful. They are beautiful. They are sweet. The life of faith has so often been cast in the moral register. What's right and what's wrong. And that's not wholly wrong, but it is woefully inadequate, I want to say. If all we think about following Jesus is right and wrong, then we're missing out on much of what following Jesus means. Following Jesus is not just about a moral life. It includes it absolutely. We pursue righteousness. We pursue holiness in such a way that we become gifts to the world and not debits. Like, imagine that. Imagine that your pursuit of personal godliness and holiness becomes a plus for your work, not a minus. 
Imagine, I mean, it almost feels wrong nowadays in our church culture to, to, to say that God doesn't just reckon us good, but he, he makes us good. We begin to put on the character of Christ as we grow into his likeness and we grow to love what he loves and hate what he hates. But oftentimes when we think about morality and we think about uh, the life in the moral register, we think about Angela from the office, a hypocrite, a shrewd, who wants to be like Angela? Like nobody wants to be like her at all. And that's what we think about when we think about the holy moral life. We think about Angela Martin or whatever her name is before she married the senator. The picture we should get of a morally upstanding life is one that attracts sinners, not repels them. Have you ever thought about this fact that Jesus is the holiest, I mean, even if you can compare him to, to other men, he was the only perfectly moral, holy person who's ever walked this earth. Where did you find him? Who was around him? It was all the quote unquote sinners, the outcasts, the, the moral outsiders wanted to be around him. So, yes, following Jesus entails morality. Being right isn't the goal. Reflecting Jesus to the world is the goal. Life is not only about morality, but about beauty. The commands of Jesus are not only to be seen and experienced as invitations to life, but they're to be seen and experienced as beautiful. The commands of Jesus, which can be summed up in love God and love neighbor, which is the whole law, they, they, they not only lead us into a moral life, but they lead us into a beautiful life into an attractive life, a life that sings, not because your circumstances are favorable to you, but a life that sings in the face of pain, a life that sings in the face of disappointment, a life that sings in the face of hopelessness, a life that sings when things aren't well. Life is about beauty, but the shape that this will take in the midst of an incredibly broken fractured world will mean that we sing not only when we have been delivered on the day that Jesus comes, but we begin to sing prophetically now. Even when death and sin and chaos is breathing down our necks, we sing. And so beauty has so often been seen as foreign to the church. But I want to say this, that beauty belongs to the people of God. I love what Brian Zand writes. He says this in his book, Beauty Can Save the World. He says this, he says, to a skeptical world, we are generally more accustomed to defend Christianity in terms of its truth and its goodness. But beauty also belongs to the Christian faith, and beauty has a way of sneaking past defenses and speaking in unique ways. To a generation suspicious of truth claims and unconvinced by moral assertions, beauty has a surprising allure, and everything about Christ is beautiful. His life, his miracles, his grace, his teaching, even his death, and certainly his resurrection are all beautiful. A Christianity that is deeply enchanted by Christ's beauty and thus formed, listen to this, formed and fashioned by this beauty has the opportunity to present to a skeptical and jaded world an aspect of the gospel that has been too rare for too long. Where truth and goodness fail to win an audience, beauty may once again captivate and draw those it enchants into the kingdom of saving grace. It is possible, he closes, it is possible to tell the Christian story in terms of aesthetics because the story of Jesus Christ is breathtakingly beautiful. When was the last time that we stood back and we looked at the gospel and we meditated on the gospel and not just said it's right or good for me, but it's, it's simply beautiful. The commands of Jesus are invitations, and the commands of Jesus are beautiful. Third, and finally, as I invite the band up, I want to say that the commands of Jesus are not ways to earn God's love. They are ways to enjoy and express God's love. I need to be so clear here. I need to say this a thousand times to us, that obedience does not earn God's love. They are ways to enjoy and to express it. Theoretically, you could from right now, theoretically, you could from right now not sin one more time for the rest of your life. 
And God's love for you would not have grown by a millimeter. Do we get that? I mean, I don't think I get that, to be perfectly honest with you. That if I'd never said anything mean or bad about someone, never cussed again, never sinned again, always kept below the speed limit, God would not love me a millimeter more. The love of God for you wouldn't have grown the width of a strain of hair at the end of your life. You right now, sitting there all jacked up, is the version that God literally to death loves. In fact, it's not even this version, because y'all are dressed up for church. Y'all are on, on, on your best behavior today. I'm talking about your jacked up, jacked up self. Your morning breath self. Your cussing because you got caught off on the M5 self. Your jealous self, your lustful self, your prideful self, your money hungry self, your, chat, your, your status chasing self, the things that you may still be hiding self. God looks at you at your worst and calls you his own. He is not ashamed of you today. And that's why the scriptures say in the book of Hebrews say that Jesus is not ashamed to call me a brother. He's not ashamed to call you a sister. He loves you fully right now, right here. Listen, I have not been a perfect father myself. And I lament that. I have not been a perfect father. One thing, though, that I've tried to do throughout the journey of my imperfect parenting is remind these kids that I love them. And that my love for them is not dependent on their obedience to me. And so from the earliest of ages, Evie, Johnny, Anthony, does daddy love you more when you obey? No, daddy. Does daddy love you less when you disobey? No, daddy. And yet we carry with us in our bones, in our trauma, in our history, in, in the stories that we tell ourselves that our dad in heaven loves us more or loves us less based on our obedience. But our obedience does not earn us an iota of God's love, but it is a pathway toward enjoying God's love and expressing it to a world that desperately needs it. To align our hearts and our minds with the heart and mind of God will bring us more into an awareness that we are loved and we get to enjoy that fact. Our obedience is not just for us to enjoy God, but it's, our obedience is also missional. I want to remind us of one of the foundational texts of this church. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We love that, right? Man, I'm chosen, right? I'm royal. I'm, 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 I'm holy. I'm God's possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have been made his own. We are loved so that we would proclaim it to the world so that we would obey. We would obey the commands of Jesus, not in our power, but in the power of the Spirit, not to earn God's love, but to express it. And our lives become a sermon. You have people in your life. I have people in my life who will never come here, right? Ever. Don like the doors of a church to hear a sermon. But our lives are sermons, a sermon of God's goodness, a sermon of God's truth, a sermon of God's beauty. And ultimately, it's a sermon about a God who would refuse to let his creation go down the drain, a God who would put his very own self on the line, who would not only be willing to pay the price of my rebellion, but who would ultimately meet the most gruesome death in order to secure the salvation of the world. So as we go out today and we have our weeks full of goodness and of things that we are anxious about and nervous about and worried about as we go out i want us to carry this in our hearts that the holy spirit the holy helper he would impress this truth the commands of jesus are not oppressive that the directives of scripture are not designed to stamp out joy but this is the truth that the commands of jesus are beautiful invitations to enjoy and express god's 
love. The commands of Jesus are beautiful invitations to enjoy and express God's love. And may this heart come alive in our hearts this week. And as God's people, may we go out first enjoying the reality that we have been loved perfectly and go out rejoicing in the fact that we get to partner with God in the renewal of all things. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your mercy. And more than that, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are good to us and you're good for us and your commands do not stamp out our joy, but they are pathways to expressing that. And so now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do a work, that I may just step out of the way, that you may take the words of this very imperfect and feeble man and you would do something beautiful with them in the hearts and in in the minds of your people. For those who particularly may not identify with Jesus here today, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would draw them near into this beautiful story of redemption. That they would find their true self in you today. We love you, Jesus. You are beautiful. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.